focus on cloud, location, data center, industry, trends, the dynamic market. I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and I am so glad to be joined by Ty Miller. Ty is the Chief Revenue Officer with Stack Infrastructure. Uh, Ty, good to see you. Glad you're joining us. Pleasure to be here, David. Glad to join Data Center Hawk today. Ty, before we begin, would love to just know uh, about your background. How did you get into the data center industry? Well, like most people uh, in the industry, I kind of fell into it. Um, that's a bit of a stretch. You know, I've been, I've been out of school for 25 plus years and um, I started out entrepreneurially in the telecom space um, and communications infrastructure um, over the, the course of the last couple of decades has um, really connected networks to data centers. Um, and so my career progression was, was starting as an entrepreneur uh, in the telecom space down in Miami, Florida of all places. Oh, wow. In the early mid nineties. Um, got into network selling with MFS communications. So that was product. Migrated uh, into a, an interactive voice response sales role, solution selling for NextLink Interactive, which was a Craig McCaw company. Um, who was a big cellular pioneer, if you may remember, 20 years ago. Um, came out of that and, and really was um, early into co-location. I was one of the first 40 employees at Switching Data. Sure. Um, and Switching Data, for those uh, of your listeners who <laughs> care to recall, <laughs> um, was a, an early direct competitor of Equinix. Um, really, uh, I was in California, but it was the East Coast um, competitor to Equinix, which was here in the San Francisco Bay Area where I live now. Um, and uh, I ran sales for the Western United States there. So that was sales leadership and getting into retail co-location and interconnection. Switching data eventually went public and was acquired and absorbed into Equinix. Um, so that was a lot of good foundational work in data centers. I spent some time back to entrepreneurial roots with some partners helping companies divest major assets that they'd acquired during the dot-com bubble. So um, sold uh, entire metro city networks, you know, from telecom companies to private equity buyers and so forth and so on. Um, there's a funny anecdote I could tell you, not on this podcast, but about selling uh, Enron's fiber optic cable reels surplus to Russian buyers over yeah. Skype. Uh, <laughs> that's, a whole different, that's a whole different gear. Sure. But then I came back around to, into general management at hosting.com. Um, so we had data centers, we had co-location, we also had managed hosting, uh, what, what is now known as cloud services, so virtual servers. Um, and then really spent uh, nearly eight years at digital realty from 20, um, 2011, uh, 2010, 2011, until I started with uh, IPI and what is now Stack Infrastructure and a digital, you know, global market leader in wholesale uh, data centers and, and you know, now they have an integrated platform down to retail and interconnection. But um, I spent most of my time in, in global selling and sales leadership at digital. Um, and all that prepared me to somehow get this lucky job at Stack. Um, really fortunate to work with great people, great investors. And uh, it's been a great two years. I hit, I hit two years uh, just a couple of days ago, David, and I'm not really sure where the time has gone. <laughs> it's been an, an incredible first couple of years here. Yeah, and y'all have been busy. I mean, we, you know, obviously at Data Center Hawk, we're watching the industry and it's uh, really fun to get to see what, uh, you know, different data center operators are doing. Uh, you all have uh, started off in a few markets, but have since, since then have made some acquisitions and have grown. So maybe just take a minute to tell us about Stack um, and maybe highlight some of the markets that you're in. I mean, I'll just, for those listening, you know, they're in Chicago, Northern Virginia, Atlanta, Dallas, uh, Phoenix, Portland, Silicon Valley, uh, New Albany, which is Columbus, Ohio. Uh, so they're, they're across the nation. Uh, but, but maybe just tell us about the, the portfolio and the company and, and highlight some of those markets. Yeah, um, thanks, David. Our sponsor fund, IPI, um, acquired a, a set of assets from various parties and elected to start its own management team uh, back in 2018. So I came on um, at a time when we had six assets um, and uh, we were in six markets. And those markets were, were former Infomart assets uh, in Portland, Silicon Valley and in, in Ashburn, Sterling, Virginia. And then um, IPI had acquired some T5 assets in Atlanta, um, Dallas and Chicago. Since then, um, Stack, which was branded in January of 2019 and, and launched into the market as a new brand, 
but with not a brand new group of people, right? Sure. Franklin's got a lot of experienced partners of mine on the senior leadership team and, and the people that we've hired. Um, so really um, expert and experienced group. But since we've acquired our way into New Albany through a sale lease back with uh, Nationwide Insurance, it's a public statement. Um, and we, we love that market and I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, and we have a position in, in Phoenix. So those are our eight markets in the, in the continental United States, lower 48. Um, and we have a, a North American charter today. And so we're looking at expansion. But um, our thesis, uh, the investor's thesis from the beginning was to be in the major data center markets, um, uh, markets that have been, will be in the future and are today, uh, great, great core markets. Um, and so we're really here to be a wholesale provider and to facilitate the growth of the cloud um, and, and do that through uh, scale and speed. Um, you know, across, if you think about the markets that we're in, we just listed them. Northern Virginia, of course, the, the largest market on planet Earth, um, pretty incredible place to be. Silicon Valley, a global top 10 market, right? Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Phoenix, all US top 10 markets. Um, and then, you know, emerging markets. Um, Portland, I think, is the fastest growing market, certainly in the Western United States. But if you look at growth year over year, it may be the, the highest percentage growth market um, in the United States. Uh, and, and we really think that um, as you think about the growth of the cloud, helping the cloud get into regions where they're close, closer to population centers, low latency, low TCO locations, those are the reasons why we look to expand on our market leadership in Hillsborough, Oregon. Um, that's the th thesis behind getting into New Albany, um, the greater Columbus region. You think about um, New Albany itself, it's seen massive cloud investment from Amazon, Google, Facebook. It's not been a wholesale data center market really ever. Um, but the strategic importance of the geography, if you look on the map, it's midway between Chicago and Ashburn. Um, and the third leg of the triangle is New York City. And so you got 50% of the the population of the United States within a low latency, um, you know, five millisecond sort of ring from New Albany. And that's why it's a, it's a fast growing cloud region. So we're there to support that growth. And, you know, we're optimistic that, that that's going to pay off over time. Um, and, you know, Phoenix itself, that's, that's our newest market position. And we have a, a land holding in the West Valley. And if you think about the way Phoenix is growing, it's following patterns you'll find in, markets like that are a little more mature, like Atlanta and Dallas, wherein you have the, the data center internet exchange or the old carrier hotels in the city center. And then you find sub markets emerging on the four points of the compass, right? And so in, in Phoenix, you have the downtown carrier hotels, and then you have a, a pretty mature wholesale market to the south in Chandler, um, emerging stuff to the east in Mesa. Um, there's some stuff in North Phoenix. Some of my competitors have taken a position there. And then the West Valley, out in Avondale, where we are, we're in the uh, Avondale Tech Techplex, um, which is right adjacent to Goodyear. You've seen a whole host of uh, new entrants to that market, some large cloud providers out there, and then uh, some people that are building spec shell, and we have a la large land holding there. So all of that's consistent with our objective of supporting cloud growth on a wholesale basis in low TCO, important markets, close to a lot of eyeballs. Make sense? Absolutely. You, you mentioned the the growth of the cloud several times, and and I wonder if help, help people understand maybe the scale of that, and then also how that changed because that's really I think you know through the discussions that we have with industry leaders like yourself, you know it is very clear that there is a trend that is changing the way the market is operating, and what you mentioned is it. You know, it is the the cloud growth. And companies like you know uh, Stack and others, and then being able to help accommodate that. So, what was you've been in the market a long time? What was the change that took place that allowed that to start happening? Well, I'll say something that may sound a little um, grandiose, perhaps, but we are all experiencing the digitization of humankind. Uh, this is a, a a unidirectional trend towards more compute, more storage, more network. Um, it's transformational. And we just happen to be lucky enough to be at, at part of the, the foundation level, the dirt and building level of that trend, right? So um, we see increasing uh, adoption of cloud services by yep. enterprises. We see utility computing. We see um, all these great new technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, 5G speeds at the edge, the internet of things. 
all of those things create more network demand, more compute, more storage, and all of that has to live in a building. Um, but you think about trends. Um, coming into this year, I did a little research, and you know, in, at the end of 2019, um, you know, your big three clouds, Amazon, uh, Microsoft Azure, and uh, the Google Com Compute Platform, um, they were growing rapidly. So AWS at the end of last year had about a third of the market share and was growing at 33% annually, right? Um, Azure was second in 18% market share, but growing at an amazing 62% annual year over year clip. And then you look at Google, which has a little smaller share, 6% uh, at the time, um, but 68% annual growth. So it's easier to grow a little faster with a, with a smaller basis. Sure, you bet. And nonetheless, these are amazing growth characteristics, right? How do you offer a global service like um, Microsoft Azure, as an example, and, and you have your growth is 60% plus year over year? Um, all of those companies self-perform and build and operate their own data centers. None of them can do it all themselves, and they need trusted third-party partners to develop, build, operate for them um, in a trusted way that helps accelerate their growth, right? So that was before COVID. Yeah. Right? So now we have a global pandemic. And if you ask me coming into 2020 what I was scared of, I was scared of black swan events. Um, certainly a global pandemic is a black swan event. Um, it happened to be a black swan that's been a boon to our sector of yep. the economy. Um, so you take those growth factors before COVID. And, you know, here's, here's a great example. Um, and this is public. Microsoft Teams, right, in early March, 900 million minutes a day on their global platform. 30 days later, 4.1 billion minutes. <laughs> That's a 5x increase in a month, right? So this yeah. shift to work at home, learn at home, more streaming. So um, the, the result of all that is the, um, there's been a massive increase in absorption, expansions, capacity planning is insane. You know, the cloud companies had a hard time capacity planning more than two or three quarters in advance before the pandemic. Sure. Now, forget about it. I mean, how do you plan for 500% increase in 30 or 45 days, right? You don't. Um, so the result has been very, uh, very fortunate time for data center operators. And that, that includes edge. It includes interconnection, uh, retail co-location. I mean, Equinix has been on fire. Anybody who needs network and has a platform um, has been expanding like crazy. So it's a good time to be in our business. Um, unfortunately, um, it's been accelerated by a horrible global pandemic that we can't control um, and, uh, and hopefully it abates soon. Um, but I think there's some permanent shifts that come out of this um, post pandemic world where we're gonna have uh, more dislocated workers working remotely because we figured out how to do that better. Yep. Um, you know, the, the subject of e-learning is gonna be much more common. Um, uh, you know, hopefully our, our kids are back in, in school physically soon. Uh, that's my hope. Um, but the idea of, of distance learning, distance telemedicine is, is exploding, right? Because who wants to actually go to the doctor right now, but a lot of people need to talk to a doctor. Sure. So those are, those are fun trends that will persist. Um, and we just think it's a, a great time to be in our business. The market's as healthy as it's ever been. Um, the, the scale of deals is larger than it's ever been. And, uh, you know, as a, as a corollary to that, more capital is surging into our space yeah. perhaps than ever before. And that has some other effects that, that maybe we can talk about too. Sure. Yeah. So talk about how, like, Stack's approach to – development in these markets that you're in, uh, you know, if, if for those that are listening that don't understand maybe the hyperscale market, you know, or maybe and you mentioned the, the invest, investment dollars coming into the space that don't understand the type of capital that it takes to actually do what it is you are doing. Just talk about that as it relates to, you know, we're buying campuses, not that are 10 acres, but are 100 acres, you know, that not can be 10 megawatts over time, but 200 megawatts over time. Talk just about what you have to do as a provider to, to actually offer those services to these large companies. Yeah, so the, the, thanks, David. The value that we're proposing to large cloud companies and hyperscalers is really speed and scale and, and with a friendly attitude and in, sure. in doing business. Um, but importantly, the, the problems that we're solving is how to help them get on up and running 
online for their users faster, right? So that they don't miss on revenue opportunities or they don't have uh, service performance degradation because they just, they just don't have enough uh, instances out there to support 4.1 billion minutes a day in usage, right? Um, so we're all growing through that together, but um, our strategy in order to enable that um, cuts across a few different variables. Uh, the first is we want to proactively be in the be in the places they need to be um, and anticipate where they're going to be. So this is one of the reasons we don't take speculative risk into um, third tier markets. Is we're not our crystal ball isn't that clear. Yeah, but we know that workloads are increasing in these core markets. So first, it's being in the right geographies. The second is how do you enable scale? Um, the buildings that we build today are much much larger than buildings that say digital realty built five years ago. Now digital and others are also building at this sort of scale, but to give you an idea, um, our recent uh, growth on our campus in Silicon Valley was a 32 megawatt building. Um, in, in Chicago, we put every, every kilowatt we could into that land and so we put 24 megawatts up. Um, our campus expansion that we're, uh, we have a groundbreaking next week in fact in Hillsboro, Oregon, that's an 80, four megawatt master plan campus. Phase one is 24 megawatts. So the quantums are much, much different. A decade ago at Digital Realty, you may recall, digital built buildings that maybe had two to four 1.125 megawatt data halls in them. The TKDs, oh yeah, you KDs. bet. Now we're on to TKFs, right? So somehow I skipped over E and got to F. <laughs> but, um, but nonetheless, just the, the, the entirety of the of the business has changed in terms of scale. Those those old rooms at 1,125 kilowatts are now six megawatt rooms, right? Sure. So um, th that's a way to facilitate scale. Um, in order to facilitate speed, we have to be able to rapidly deploy. And like many others, we've stood up our own supply chain, right? We have our, our unique basis of design, which isn't radical and, and revolutionary, but it's on the, on the leading edge for mechanical efficiency and, and uh, overall costs, right? Um, and that, that's a way that we can stand up new product faster. The third way you stand up new product faster is to have the land in order to do it. So to your comment about campus sizes, um, I mentioned Portland where we're on 28 acres that allows us to put up 84 megawatts. Um, we hold some land holdings um, inside of Stack but we're really blessed and, and fortunate to have a tremendous, um, uh, a tremendously strong stable of developer partners in various regions who land bank in their own business. And so we're able to access land banks that, that we softly control, mm -hmm. but perhaps are not yet on our balance sheet as a way to be in the market um, and rapidly respond to requirements, whether they're, um, you know, government build to suit opportunities that come up. We want to be able to rapidly respond to those. Or we have land banks where we can push um, massive scale on a development timeline that is, is faster than someone going it alone. I'll give you an example. In Texas, we're fortunate to partner with Hillwood. And Hillwood is a Ross Perot Jr. company. They're a significant developer um, not just in Texas, but across the U.S. and in other, other countries around the world. Um, but they've got it figured out in Alliance, Texas. And Alliance, Texas um, is where we have land allocation and power allocation on pad-ready um, parcels um, so that we can rapidly facilitate large-scale development. Um, you may recall that in Alliance, that's where Facebook has landed one of their global data centers. I think it was their fifth in their series. Um, QTS is a provider there. There's some other enterprise data centers. Um, but we think Fort Worth and Alliance is a, is a really important emerging submarket for Greater Dallas. Um, but it's our partnership with Hillwood that gives us the strength of those land holdings, the development expertise, frankly, the, the local, municipal, city, and state relationships that allows Stack, a relatively new company, to act like a very experienced company, right? Um, we have our own experience in-house, of course, um, but having those partnerships is really important. And so we have partners like that in, in the Northern, Northern Virginia, Mid-Atlantic area. We have partners like that in, in Silicon Valley. And I won't go through the full list of, of everybody that we're partnered with, but having the combination of scale and design, 
a supply chain that can deliver quickly and land banks to let you get out ahead of that demand, really, really important. Um, I, I will mention one, one, one more, and that is um, in Northern Virginia, the number one market in the world, um, we happen to own the original AOL data center um, that was oh, yes. massively overbuilt for its time. Um, <laughs> And it's a great, um, great historical building. And we've got a great client in there um, that's growing and it's fantastic. But, you know, at the time it was built for six megawatts and we've, we've uh, re-engineered it and expanded it. And now it's a 17 megawatt building. Well, that's a small building by, by the, today's standards in that geography. In Manassas, however, with our partner, Peterson Companies, we have 125 acre campus and we went out ahead and, and master planned it. We've graded four super pads, so four independent, um, secure, build to suit opportunities or development opportunities. Um, we're very fortunate that phase one is obligated already. Um, but we can't do that by ourselves, right? So we've got 250 megawatts of power kind of penciled for that site. We've got the land there to rapidly expand. And so it's, it's that kind of synergy with our development partners that is one of the things that um, enables us to be responsive and provide value to the hyperscalers. I'll pause it. Yeah, and that's like the formula that you mentioned. I mean, so much of it is speed, scale, um, you know, land in different places that these companies want to grow. And it seems like if you have that formula of those things together, you're in a really good spot to handle those demands moving forward. I'm interested in, we, we talked a little bit about COVID-19 and some of the things uh, that have impacted the market, but just from your perspective, I mean, how have you seen, um, you know, the, the pandemic really impact our space and, and how do you think that will uh, impact things moving forward? Well, um, I did touch on it previously. I think that there's some permanent trends that when, even when we get to post pandemic, the idea of, of remote working, learning, um, and services will persist, right? And so we, we've created kind of a, a new way of interacting professionally. Um, you know, I think most of us probably spend several hours a day on video. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that goes away, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think the overall uh, digitization of humanity, as I mentioned earlier, it continues and it, and it probably accelerates in some cases. Um, you know, we're right on the front end of this, I know. I know the data center industry feels mature, perhaps for those of us that have been hacking away for 20, 25 years at this. You know, back to the days of, of even Exodus in the 90s, <laughs> uh, maybe one of the the, the dot com uh, bubble companies. Um, so, uh, in reality, I really believe, David, we're still in early innings, um, and there are some more mature geographies. Um, there's still massive growth here to be had in the United States, but there's there there's um, underdeveloped data center uh, regions around the world. South America is just coming on. We saw Ascenti do quite well there and, and Digital joined them in a joint venture to kind of uh, press down into South America. Um, Africa is still very undeveloped. The Middle East is very undeveloped. Um, Western Europe, you know, the flap cities in Dublin, those five markets are, are pretty um, heavily competitive and there's a lot of solutions there. Those are also the same, the same kind of mature markets where more demand will be needed because it's such a core market, right? You get to be a little bit on a, on a momentum flywheel in those core markets, but you're also seeing now uh, secondary European cities come on, whether it's Spain, Italy, Poland, the Nordics, right? Um, you need data centers in all these locations. Um, and I'm not talking about edge pops. I'm talking about core data centers. The other trend that comes into that, of course, is data sovereignty, um, particularly within the EU where uh, a number of uh, countries have said, hey, we, we like German data, the state in Germany as an example. Yep, yep. Um, so that drives more kind of core data centers in addition to network and edge deployments. Um, Asia PAC, um, probably a little less developed than Western Europe, um, but still very competitive and lots of new announcements coming um, almost every week it seems. There's a major announcement about uh, Japan or, or South Korea or Singapore is pretty well, um, pretty well spoken for at the moment. Uh, so I think people are looking to grow in other spots uh, across the APAC region. Um, so I still think it's early innings for our business. There's a lot of great opportunity out there, and we're happy to participate in it in North America for now. But I'll bet you, I'll 
bet you a dollar that our clients ask us to, uh, oh, to yeah. leave, leave the States and, and leave North America. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is when you've delivered and you've earned trust yep. um, and you have a working relationship, um, your clients will take you all over the globe with them. Yeah, I was talking on the phone earlier today about some of the growth that we've seen over the last you know year in the market. And, and so much of it has come from you know, relationships that companies have had with providers where, you know, it might be hard right now in the midst of a pandemic to, you know, onboard new vendors or new partners. But if you have that trusted relationship and you can expand easily with a company, you know, in the same market or in another market in a facility that's very similar to the one that you're in, you know, that certainly uh, is a path that we've seen, you know, a number of the enterprise users and hyperscalers take. Um, What do you think are some of the technologies that will impact uh, that growth moving forward. I mean, you just, you gave a really good view of like international uh, perspective on different markets and, and how they will go in the future. But what do you think are some of the technologies that will impact that? Well, um, earlier, I kind of ran through just a quick list of, of ideas and, and technology concepts that are going to be great drivers, right? So high performance compute, um, artificial intelligence, machine early learning, those are all heavy, heavy compute intensive things. Mm-hmm. And Bitcoin mining is heavily compute intensive, right? That's a whole different. Subject. Sure. Um, so you have these these uh, these compute requirements that are growing in, in leaps and bounds, and I'm not smart enough, honestly, to to forecast uh, X percent. I just know it's big. It's kind of like surfing a tsunami. You're not really you don't really care exactly whether the wave is 200 feet tall or 180 feet tall. <laughs> sure. It's really big, and you're hoping to not fall. Um, So I think those things are drivers of compute, right? Um, Internet of Things is a driver of both network uh, and compute, but it's a major driver of of network. And and it also applies to a lot of edge distribution. Now, Stack Mm -hmm. today is not a participant in edge data centers, but certainly there's many, many companies that are making a bet, trying to tie up with, uh, you know, tower operators or have edge huts. Um, That's not where we've chosen to focus today at Stack, um, but certainly if you think about the horizontal integration of the network and where compute needs to happen, um, the, the edge is, a, is a, an incredible trend. And so um, 5G services and Internet of Things drive that side of the business. Um, and then finally, you know, we keep growing people on this planet, and those people have devices, and they want to take pictures and store crazy cat videos, and they've got to go somewhere. And typically that, that, that storage, whether it's hot storage or cold storage, it resides in a big old data center. So yep. we want to build them cost effectively. And you can have different different resiliency tiers for different products, right? Like your crazy cat video can probably be on a less resilient, more remote location that isn't um, content latency sensitive. Um, but we're also, we're also people, we're measurably flawed and, and we want stuff when we want it, we want it now. And that means uh, you gotta have lower latency services. And so ultimately, I don't think you solve that problem only with edge and you keep just a few uh, data lakes, so to speak, um, positioned around the country. I think, I think you just have larger and larger cores um, and then distributed cores. It's almost mm-hmm. like thinking about the modern uh, global airport system, right? You have, um, you have DFW and you have Atlanta, Hartsfield and LAX, right? And those are major, you know, the New Yorks, those are the big ones, right? But the regional airports that are also international, they're pretty darn big too. Right. So from a quantum perspective, you know, um, we're seeing committed deals in our industry now, 36 megs at a time, 72 megawatts at a time, or maybe one that crests over 100 megawatts at a time. Um, you can go and, and interview Hossein again, and, and he'll tell you he wants to build the biggest data centers that have ever been built. And, and he's not wrong. Um, you know, uh, great credit to him for driving what is hyperscale before there was ever hyperscale. Mm-hmm. Right? He's a real pioneer and he's been richly rewarded because of it. Um, so he's a, he's a great leader for our industry. Um, so um, lots of trends. And the other thing, David, is I don't know what's around the corner. I'm, I'm no technologist. I don't know when the next, you know, holodeck is going to come out, you know, instead of being on the Star Trek, you know, Starship Enterprise, <laughs> it might be, you know, down the street where you go to play. I don't know. Uh, I just know that takes a lot of compute. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Anyway, I'm not a futurist. I'll leave that to to other people. And and, and I think, um, you know, guys like Dean Nelson who want to look around the curve. um, I'm just trying to keep up and and keep my clients really happy by giving them 
scalability and speed with a smile. Sure. What, uh, what gets you most excited about, you know, being in this space? And, you know, one of the things that, that I have tried to do on, you know, a number of these discussions that we have is, is really help uh, younger tenured professionals understand this market and the opportunity that's here. And, uh, and, and that's been an important part of our company. I know it's important to companies like yours and others in this space. But if you were to sell this industry to someone saying, hey, this is why you should come join the data center industry, either as an engineer or uh, from a construction side of things or from a technology side, what, why should they do that? What makes this uh, industry um, so attractive? Well, um, it's a great question, David. I'll, I'll take a couple cuts at it. Cut one is um, data is, uh, is the oil of the information age, right? Uh, it, it is the lifeblood of our future. And so um, participating in this industry is like building the future digital um, uh, horizon for, for mankind um, and womankind. That's not meant to be sure. in any way sexist. Um, the other thing is just as a, I would tell, I would tell my kids that being in the, in the data center infrastructure world, um, it's likely to grow throughout their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Turns out cloud is not a fad. <laughs> um, so it, it's not going away uh, and it's not going backwards. Right. So I think you have a long-term horizon for growth. Um, one of the things that makes me really happy to be in this business, David, um, I'll give you a second answer is uh, what we foundationally do at Stack isn't necessarily cool. And we're not in and of itself changing the world. I mean, let's, let's be clear. We take dirt, we build buildings, we put machines into them, we operate those machines all for the benefit of keeping someone else's power on and their machines cool and their, con and their connectivity up, right? Fundamentally, um, what is cool is is the companies and the people we do that for that enable them to go out and, and change the world. And so it's the next social media platform or it's the next um, uh, high performance compute where someone's gonna build an algorithm that's gonna solve cancer, right? It's, it's medical research. It's, it's things that I can't predict because I'm not sharp enough to do that. But I just know that what they're doing inside of our four walls and what we enable them to do is cool so I'm hoping through the transitive property, you kind of have some of that coolness kind of brush off <laughs> a little bit, feel good about what we do, um, maybe seem a little less nerdy at a cocktail party. Right? <laughs> I couldn't explain for the life of me to, to my peers and, and, you know, you go home and you see grandma in your early career and, you know, it's, it's 2000 and they're like, what are you doing? Cola, what? I, oh, yeah. Confused, oh, right? yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's becoming cooler. It's becoming sexier. I think. <laughs> I think the trend persists, you know, for, for generations, um, honestly. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate what a lot of us are trying to do in the industry, which is, is create um, recruiting and training programs and, and enable new people to join into our, our industry. I'm proud of the efforts our industry is making um, to encourage more women to participate and to support women in technology um, or the Women's Technology Forum. I'm proud of all those things. And then as it relates to Stack, and you know, I'm excited to be here because we got a chance to start a brand new company on a really great foundation of tremendous uh, A-list clients. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, two years ago, David, I started. We had, I don't know, 27 employees. We've, we've got three times that many today, uh, roughly. Um, we've doubled the size of our platform. Um, we've raised a, a billion four with an investment grade rating um, at some of the lowest cost of capital out there. And all that goes to um, what we're doing uh, in terms of the type of people we've been able to bring onto our team, the type of clients that we have. It feels like a really good foundation for, for growth. Um, and I love helping build the culture here, right, where we, we intentionally call the people that we do business with clients because we aim to provide them with a level of service, not a product and walk away. And God forbid you call them tenants. Um, landlords aren't the most friendly people on earth. So, um, you know, we, we talk about every day at Stack treating our, our clients um, with a client first mentality, right? And if we service them, you know, we'll, we'll come out good in the end. Uh, and then lastly, I, I like being part of this leadership team because Brian Cox is a, is a great CEO and my peers on the senior team are, are all fantastic professionals and great people. But we try to do it with a, a low ego level of leadership. Um, it's not all about us. 
Um, and these are, these are kind of interesting and trying times culturally, trying to lead through a pandemic, through uh, social unrest, through uh, reform in a political year. Um, there are some days, I'll be honest, I go home, it's a little exhausting. But you wake up the next day with a smile and you, you pick everybody up and you dust them off and you, you give them an orange slice and you tell them to get back into the fight. So um, it, it's good times. We're, we're having a great time at Stack and we're so fortunate, candidly, to, to be doing business with some of the best companies in the world. Well, Ty, thank you so much for taking time to give us an overview on Stack. And uh, if you want to, if you're watching, you want to learn more about Stack, you can go to stackinfra.com. That is their website where you can, uh, you know, look at a lot of the things that we spoke about today. But Ty, we really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing Stack and the rest of your team uh, grow and succeed in the future. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, good fortune moving forward. Bye-bye.